We're such impatient people, and I include myself in this. I know that patience is a fruit of the Spirit, and yet all our culture seems to make us more used to instant on. Whether it's from our food to our ordering to our delivering, it's all like we want it to be now. I remember when I was a kid, in, on Sundays in the winter, my dad used to go out to the garage, which was not attached to the house, like five, ten minutes before the family had to leave, and he would warm up the car because we had vinyl seats. And then the family would get in four in the back row and three in the front bench and head to church. Today, coming to church, heated seat button. Perfect, you know, right now. That's more what we're used to. So when it talks in the Bible about waiting a thousand years for God to accomplish his plan, it sounds almost foreign. It sounds like back in time because nobody really waits like that anymore. If you're waiting at all, you're checking what's happening on your phone, you know. We're not in the same mindset as, uh, as the passage talks about. But a couple weeks ago, God made me wait. I mean, I was helping my son in Minneapolis with a house project, and on the way back, I-35 became an ice slick. And I was caught in that line of people just crawling, stop, crawling, stop. And you know how I felt? Who are all these people in front of me? What are they doing there? They should just get off the road. I don't know. Okay, so there's some people sliding off the road. Not enough. You know, it's like, don't they know I got to get ready for Sunday? I got to get along here. And, and that's, how, that's how we tend to feel. That's how people were feeling that Peter wrote this letter to because they were in a church and the people outside the church were saying, oh, you think Jesus is coming back? Oh, where is he? He's not coming back. And the people in the church were going like, it's been 35 years. What's taking God so long, you know? But maybe if we knew the reason for waiting, we'd have a better attitude when we need to wait. And so Peter is trying to fill them in on that. Fill them in on what's going on with all of this waiting in our text for today. It's kind of like when you're in construction on, not in construction, but when you're in a traffic jam on 35 and everyone's merging down to one road and you know that it's not road construction, you probably figure out what's going on. Probably if you, when you get up to where the traffic is flowing again, you'll see the police lights, maybe even a wrecker, maybe the car that's there, and then you'll feel terrible. Like you'll feel like, here I was so impatient. And this was life and death for somebody here. This was, this was the, the most horrible day in their life, perhaps. And I was like, can you just get on with it? In the same way, Peter says, you think God is taking a long time to come back and bring all his plan to fruition. But let me tell you, it's so important for somebody else. Peter says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The whole reason God is waiting, like he is, is because there are people he wants to see with him in heaven, and he's not done yet working on them with the gospel to bring them there. And yeah, we have to wait, but it's a very small sacrifice when it means eternal life to somebody else. The end, of course, is coming. And when it does... There'll be no such thing as waiting anymore because time will end. I think that's what Peter means when he says, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. I don't agree with some people who use this passage to try to reconcile creation and evolution as saying, okay, like it says here a day can be a long time to God, so maybe one day of creation was like this very long period of time. And one reason I don't agree with that interpretation is because God goes way out of his way to explain what a day is in Genesis chapter 1 when he says, and there was evening, and there was morning, and that was day one. And he does this with every day. And there was evening, and there was morning, and that was day two. As if to say, it was one spin of the earth, because I'm God. I can create the earth any way I want to. I'm almighty. And so that's the way he said he did it. 
Instead, I think what Peter's saying here in this verse is that time is very different for God. It's like if I'm reading the Bible passages right, it seems like for God, he is in eternity, which means he's not like us when we're used to time going one minute, one minute, one minute. He's in like all of time at once. And so when he says soon, it means something very different to him than what we experience. He's got a different perspective. When I was about 15 years old, I helped my older brother-in-law renail the roof of my father's barn. After 50 years of wind and storms and such, the, the sheet metal had kind of loosened up there, and we needed to pound each one securely on again. And so we utilized something that we called a cherry picker, which was really a bucket on the end of a long arm that was lifted up from a truck. And we went up there, and it got close right where we needed to be, and we nailed that, the, the, the sheet metal back on stronger again. And then because we were young guys, we played with it. You know, hey, how far can we make it go this way? Can it spin all the way around? What if we go straight up? Can we make it go like, uh, straighten out that, that elbow there and, and be like a pencil and us the eraser way up high? I looked online, there was no picture of that. So I think it's not recommended. Um, <laughs> but we did. And uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, I had spent my entire life on that farmstead there. I knew every inch of it. But it looked totally different from up there, looking down, than at eye level. And I think what Peter's trying to do here is to get us to see our life a little different. Like maybe from God's point of view more than how we normally see it. Because, you know, normally when we look at life, we don't, we don't think about the end of the world very much. But it's very important to God as far as his plan and, and, and what we are going to experience in life. Peter says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? What kind of a person would you be if you saw everything from God's point of view, how you're living it here? That's the question. Peter says the heavens are going to disappear with a roar that's a very sudden, loud sound, and it's a specific sound because sometimes languages make a sound that tries to sound like the sound. So this word in Greek is hroisodon, and it's, it's meant to imitate an arrow flying by you. Like you're standing here, someone over there shoots an arrow, and it hits a target there, and it goes hroisodon, you know? And as soon as you, well, if yet were you, you would hear the and you'd look, what? And the arrow would already be past you to go tsudong. And that's kind of like what the end of the world's going to be like. There's going to be this big sound. You're going to go, what? Oh, and then it's going to be done. And it's not going to be time at that moment to say, oh, yeah, I, that repentance thing, I didn't get to that. Or I got to get right with God, or I need to say a prayer. It's going to be, you're going to be ready, or you're going to not be ready. Kind of like a deer hunter that I was talking to some time ago who was going to be the whole day in the deer stand, and so he brought himself a nice sandwich for when he'd get hungry. Well, he gets hungry, gets out the sandwich, gets to take a bite, and there in front of him is right what he was waiting for. And, of course, his gun's down there, his sandwich is right here. He did not get the deer because he was not ready for the moment. And, and, and Peter is saying, okay, we live our life ready for the moment if we believe this word from God of what he is going to accomplish. He says the, ha the elements will be destroyed. That's everything God made. All the mountains, all the lakes, that's all going to be gone. And everything done in it will be laid bare. That's everything humans do, like the pyramids and the dams and all of that. It's like it's going to be wiped clean so God can do his new thing with the new heavens and the new earth. And that's what Peter says is coming for all of us. And what's going to be left? God, God's word, the praise of men and angels, um, people, heaven and hell. 
Not too much else. So Peter says, if you believe that, what kind of person are you going to be? And the obvious answer is, well, not someone who sets their heart on and makes all their plans about just what's temporary, but someone who has the bigger view. So if I ask you to take a piece of paper and write down one to five and say, what are your five major life goals right now in your life? And you wrote them down, and every one of them was about something that's not going to be here forever, Peter would say you're not getting the point that, yes, yeah, some of them are about life here, but some of them are also about you've got the bigger picture of what God wants to do and what is his goal for you because of that. Right now, God says the world is going to end. That's not pessimistic. That's not nihilistic because we know God. We know he's got a good plan. We know that we are forgiven in him. We know that we are loved in him. We know that God has the best plan possible for our life, like it's coming to fulfillment because he sent Jesus in the first advent. He came. He was the Savior. He loved us. He gave his life for us, and he's coming back, the same God who loved us more than anyone, to fulfill the life he always had in mind for us in the second advent, the second coming. So now, if it seems to be taking a very long time, it's just because God's got something he wants to complete. Even right now, the gospel is going out around the world to different places, especially Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, and reaching nations or people groups that haven't had a chance to hear the word of God before. Now, balancing that, God says that the days are coming also when there are going to be more persecutions and more tribulations in this world. And it's almost like I picture God doing this balance like, right now, I'm still bringing more people into the kingdom of God and, and my plan is not yet fulfilled, but there will come a day when everything I have planned for my kingdom will be ready and then the end will come. So that every day now, I see that when there's a new day, a new morning, a new moment, it's like God saying, Good news, my gospel is still making headway. I am still accomplishing what I'm about in this world. And the love of God is winning out on this planet. More people are bring, bringing brought into the family of God. What sort of people ought you to be? Spotless, blameless, and at peace with God because we know the Savior and we know our salvation. But that brings us to a peculiar phrase in our text, I think. Peter says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Well, how do you do that? I mean, this is all God's area of doing. How do I make the end come faster? Do I even want to? How would I speed the coming? Remember when you were a kid and your parents said you were going to go on vacation and you were all excited about it, and then they were taking forever to get going, and you said, Mom, Dad, when are we going to leave? And they said, well, you could help. You could bring that stuff and put it in the car, right? How do we speed the day of God coming here? What's our role? I see three answers, and the first one's really obvious, so you should have gotten this one. First answer is, well, we can pray. Thy kingdom come. And mean it, because God hears our prayers. And when you pray that prayer, you are praying for God to reign and God to rule. You are praying for God to reach people that don't know him yet and bring them to repentance and faith. And you are praying for God to reign in you. Like, if you're like me, God reigns in your heart, but not all, always, completely. And like you're praying, like you would reign all the more in my heart, like more than you have before. And you're also praying for God to bring his good plan to conclusion and let me walk into his kingdom that he's prepared from the beginning. And all of that is included in that prayer if you mean it. I remember back in Michigan when my old car hit its third or fourth gear that I was repairing it with a mechanic friend of mine and we were putting some new nose pieces on it for the ones that had been destroyed. And I had one of those little GM trim screws that I dropped down inside there. And I was reaching in there in front where it's all scratchy plastic and try and I couldn't reach it. And my friend said, here, let me do it. And he reached in, down, down, farther, farther, and he got it. And the thing to know about my friend, he is a lot bigger than me. Two of me could have fit into his clothes easy. So I turned to him and said, how, how, did, how were you able to get that? 
And I wasn't able to get that. And he just looked at me and he said, you got to want it. And, and I think that's how God wants you to pray this prayer too. Like you mean it, like you want it, like you want his kingdom to come and speed its coming and say, okay, Lord, bring it on. You're the king. You're the good one. You, your plan is the best. Your kingdom come. Second, we speed the day, I think, by helping the gospel to reach all nations, world evangelism. Another thing Jesus said about the end time was uh, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Promise from Jesus, every people group is going to have a chance to hear the gospel, and then the end will come. So whenever we help the gospel to spread around the world, we're speeding that day. But mainly, I think what Peter's talking about here is an attitude of heart like having an inner desire to see it get here quicker. Because there's a difference between expecting something and being eager for it. You can be in the doctor's office and he can say to you, you know, well, I guess we're going to have to draw some blood. And, and you can expect it's going to happen without really being eager for it to happen. And in the same way, you can hear about, well, God's going to bring about the end of the world. And you say, yeah, that's going to happen Hope it's not this afternoon. I'd be okay if it were several hundred years later and not be eager for it. Like, God, this is the best thing that could happen. And yet that's how God wants us to have that attitude of expectation to know that finally God is going to bring about the perfection he has always wanted for your life and my life and all the world. And it'll be perfect the way he's always intended it to be. Let's suppose I told you that when you go home from church today, someone's going to put you to work. And they're going to have you mopping the kitchen floor. And you're going to be vacuuming all the stairs. And you're going to be chopping onions, 10 pounds of onions. And you're going to be doing all this work, okay? And you might say to yourself, okay, well, you know, I'm going to do this work. But if I were to say to you, and the reason you're going to do this is because someone you love almost more than anyone in the world that you haven't seen in a year is coming over and we want to be ready for this. Suddenly, you'd be doing the same thing, but it wouldn't be an imposition. You would be like, oh, why? And the only problem would be it would keep you from going to the window every 20 minutes to see if they're here yet. And God says, Advent is a time of expectation for your life. Like you are always looking forward to something wonderful. Yeah, we're looking forward to Christmas, but mainly because we know the Savior and his heart who loved us more than anything and gave his life for us. And we're also looking for that same Jesus to return again. And when he does, that will be the fulfillment of all of God's plan. It will be pretty traumatic for planet Earth. But for those of us who know and love Jesus, it will be the best day ever. Amen.